There we go. This is the Rex call for June 2021. We are, we are halfway through 2021. Lockdown is unlocking. Stuff is happening. Temporarily. You think this is going to be a third wave or a fourth oh, wave? Yeah. How, however you're counting? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, so, um, it's, so it's self-evident to you. It's like obvious that this is coming. The mutation rate is uh, fairly significant, and we're seeing the emergence of some pretty strongly virulent variants. Um, the, uh, the, the India situation is catastrophic. Right. And, uh, and uh, you know, India has people who travel. It's, it's not as locked down as China is even though China does have people who travel. Um, mostly it's, we just, we're nowhere close to a um, strong enough majority of people vaccinated in the States to uh, stop the emergence of another wave. Um, Mika? Hey, Mika. Um, and so I'm, I say I'm probably, I figure there's two thirds, three quarters, uh, 75%. Convinced there's going to be another big wave later this year. You know, oh, once winter hits, once winter coronavirus. Hits. So we're we're just like, is there going to be another big wave? Are we unlocking a little too soon? Kind of. Well, I don't know if we're unlocking too soon. It's not a case of we're we're unlocked, and so um, that's the problem. The, the problem oh. is that we have too many people who are just refusing to get vaccinated, and so right. um, you know we can unlock, and that's fine. But just be prepared that. We will need to lock lock up again because of the the lack of uh, of vaccination density. Jamey, hey, you're you're in a new spot. Yeah. Jamey, do you think that some of the people who are not vaccinated are think they're already and may in fact have some immunity because they already got it? Yes, I mean that's that's definitely the case. We've seen that uh, a number of the um, uh, Congress people who are refusing to get vaccinated are saying that because they got COVID. But unfortunately, we're seeing that while you do have some immunity, you know, some level of immunity post uh, COVID infection, it's not as strong as the immunity you get from a vaccination. Um, and people who are getting second wave COVID are getting, or a second hit of COVID are often getting a very serious hit of it. And that's just not the case. People who get who, who get infected, get sick of COVID after being vaccinated, a small percentage of people who do, and they, so far, all indications are if you get if you get COVID after vac after getting both your vaccination jabs, it will be a mild case. Um, now, I still don't want it. I still don't want a mild case because there are all questions, all questions about long COVID that we can't answer yet. Um, but you know, so there's a percentage of people who think that they're immune because they got sick already. There's a percentage of people who are saying they'll wait until it actually gets full FDA approval. Um, okay, fine. Um, we'll see whether they actually go ahead after that. There's a percentage who are waiting for the lottery numbers to get higher. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little uh, bit yeah. like, like su Super Bowl vaccine, right? Yeah. If the reward is high enough, much. I'll go get the vets. Right. A free donut just isn't enough. I, there are people who are also saying that it's just hard because they... <laughs> It's inconvenient. My my taxi driver yesterday to the airport. He works twelve hour days, and he wasn't vaccinated yet. And he said it's just because I can't find the time to go do it. He's not that, a frontline worker, and somebody didn't make it a priority to get a vaccine near him. Taxi, he works for a private taxi service. I I mean I looked it up for him. I said there's a there's a pop up center here at JFK. Why don't you go there? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there actually are quite a few places in the yeah. states, in many locations, just to compartmentalize. In yeah. the states, in the many locations, there are there are places that are doing, yeah, you know, get your vaccination at the grocery store, get your vaccination at a pop-up. It's yeah. Mika, maybe next time you could you could pay him for a fare to go get his vaccine. Yeah, that's a thought. Just and just like say here, here's here's twenty five bucks. Like pretend pretend I asked you to drive to the parking lot over there where they have tents set up and get yourself yeah. jabbed. I, I have a friend uh, who works for a group in the, in the South Bronx and th this is what they're doing. They're doing home visits, they're doing pop-ups, 
and every day, you know, they're vaccinating dozens of people. And it's really because people, you know, they didn't know where to go and you got to go find them. Yep. And, and I don't want to, to uh, diminish the fact that there are people who are, who are working multiple jobs who, who really can't get the time to do it. Um, and, you know, there, there's definitely a, a um, class and availability issue there. Yeah. But I, I would say that's not anywhere close to the majority or plurality of the people who are refusing to get vaccinated. They should Hopefully repurpose the all the vote at the same time, Mika. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> they should they should repurpose all the ice cream trucks uh, so that when you hear the little tinkling noise down the block, <laughs> and they've already got refrigeration, it's so handy, <clears throat> right? It's a funny idea. I'm uh, I'm actually uh, doing a call later this week or next week, I forget, uh, with an organization called Census Legacies. Uh, and what I know of it is that it is a group of grassroots uh, organizations that built census outreach. You know, they, they basically ran lots of census outreach programs and they are sticking together to try and repurpose to do other forms of civic outreach. Um, and I'm assuming a lot of them are doing vaccine stuff now. Mm -hmm. And some of this is a follow on of where the government funding is, right? If you can figure out how to get paid to do this, that's what my friend in the South Bronx is doing. They, he works for a nonprofit and they are getting a lot of money right now just to do this. Interesting. Yeah. So it's where the fabric is worst. But Jamey, your point is, we're already a pretty broken society. And if we can't get to whatever number, what, what is your number? 80%, 90% vaccinated? I think it's 70 to, 70 to 80, but 70 is usually the, the break point that I and, see. And supposedly we're close to that in some states and- In some states. The, the ones that vote for, for Biden. But we're, um, yeah, exactly. No, that's ac actually true. Yeah. Um, well, and, if, you uh, added, if you added survivors of COVID, to the VAX numbers in the other states, does the, do we get anywhere near 70%? No. Hmm. It, it, won't, it probably won't be as bad as last winter. But um, this probably means, but, it's endem it, it means it's endemic. It means it's gonna be like the yeah. flu season. And, and by the way, the mRNA process is a miracle. It's a freaking miracle. The idea that they can like, okay, good. We, 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 decoded the genome, we then created a replica of the spike protein, and then we created a method to actually introduce this in people. And most of the time was like testing to make sure the damn thing didn't kill, didn't kill people, right? Like, like mm -hmm. the, the, the actual creation of the vaccine was done in remarkably little time, which, yes. mean, which means give me a new variant, I can lather, rinse, repeat, and the, the, process, the, 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 the verification cycle should be shorter um, right. So, so, so my, I'm less worried about big shocks. I'm, I'm, I'm completely freaked out about India and Brazil and, uh, Argentina and Peru and Ecuador and a whole bucket of countries that are just in the complete tubes because of this, like, like that really freaks me out. But, but the places that have gotten vaccines and gotten vaccinated feel to me like, I don't know that they're going to get them. And, and, and you're also making an assumption that any new, any new crazy variant uh, bypasses the defenses of the current vaccines. Well, no, I think that's a po that is a possibility. It's what totally a possibility. What, um, but my concern is that um, because we have a lot of people who, the combination of um, a significant portion of people being non-vaccinated and unlocking will, when the conditions become more amenable to the spread, we'll see another you know, spike in cases in the U.S. Once we, and calls for a return to a lockdown. Right. I don't know whether we'll do it. Um, and in, in your favor, the the Spanish flu was two full years of flu, and the second wave was the lethal one, the very very lethal one. <clears throat> right. So there could be another wave, and it could be just just less lethal, less lethal. I'm not looking forward to it. I'm not hoping for it. Just to be really clear, I. I um, you don't have like bets on this in Vegas. No, I, that's good. <laughs> Buy more but, Moderna uh, stock. Buy more what stock? Moderna. Moderna, yeah. Mm, well, um, the mRNA, but you're actually right about that being a really um, breakthrough invention. Now, my understanding was that 
the group in the group in Germany for Pfizer group in Germany that came came got the first version out was actually working on it prior to the revealing of COVID. It was actually they were already working on this process and they said, "Aha, here is a perfect test test case for it." Right. Um, I mean, a whole lot of stuff had to be invented for this thing to work. I I know that there are several cancer treatments in development using the mRNA uh, approach. So it, this really could be an absolute medical breakthrough. And it could crack. A malaria treatment. Exactly. Or malaria prevention. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There's a whole bunch of stuff like that that's really amazing. And like, man, if they do I that, saw, then, then we will have population problems. <laughs> well, and I saw speculation that there may even be, there may potentially be a way of um, attacking Alzheimer's. Um, which would be outstanding. Yeah. Um, so, so now that we've gotten COVID out of the way, what positive Rexy things are happening in the world? What, uh, what, what good things are, are any of us involved in? Well, that was quick. Um, go ahead. Well, okay. Actually, just before we leave COVID, yeah. uh, you know, it, uh, over the last year, there have been multiple reports from northern Italy, southern France, and Spain of uh, appearance of uh, evidence of COVID uh, in 2019. And just a couple of days ago, this Med Ar Archive article appeared uh, testing uh, waste basically, which it seems to be becoming a very good way of finding indications of COVID and, and other things as well. But they found COVID since March, 2019. So, uh, so, so the basic story is yeah. that we do not know much about this thing still. So that's interesting. So that also raises the interesting idea that cities need to keep and freeze a bank of samples of their sewage system. Oh, and evidently they did in Barcelona. Wow, yeah. that's super interesting. I mean, I know everybody tests the water supply and all that kind of stuff, but the idea that that your 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 poop drainage system is actually a great meter for your civic health is really interesting. Um, Mark, if you could if you could toss a link into the uh, into the chat, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, because that because I really like to drill down more on. Well, and that sounds so awful. I'd like to investigate more. Uh, and I will, so um, Dave just put a link to an interview with Nubar Afayan in the, in the thing. Uh, Nubar is actually a venture capitalist uh, who funded the early work on the vaccine. He's really interesting. He, he's one interesting cat. I watched a different interview with him with, um, oh, what's his name at MIT? Uh, it'll come back to me. Anyway, it was a great interview. And um, his venture firm basically takes a really broad view of innovation and then tries to find where the lever is that, that somebody needs to try and then tries to find somebody who's doing the research and fund that. They sort of back their way into breakthrough uh, discoveries. It's really super interesting. So I recommend watching uh, that or just, just go on YouTube and, and do a uh, new bar of uh, But I was surprised he's, uh, he, he, like, he, he's, he's got this sort of calm demeanor of, oh, I was just making paper airplanes and then we tried a new model and we sort of folded it and it flew a really long ways. It's like that, that kind of affect and tone. And it's like, he's inventing world, you know, world-class vaccines and funding the people who, who discover that. Um, so other, uh, Mika, you had raised your hand about other positive things. No, I mean, you asked who's involved in anything positive. I, I just got off a call with a lovely group of, uh, people who are starting something called Civic Hall Brussels. Ooh. And um, I, I think I've sent you one or two things about this, Jerry. The, the framing idea is to be a hub for people working on collective intelligence um, and trying to infuse more collective intelligence problem solving techniques in government. At all levels. So I'm not. This is not. This is not uh, sparking memory for me. So I don't know that I've because Brussels plus Civic Hall is not a thing. No, that... because if it's not public yet. I mean, they've done one yeah. or two events. They were going to start last year. Obviously, COVID put a hold on that. But um, the what what is interesting to me is that it's that they actually have a founding 
core philosophy, which is tighter than the one that we started with, um, which is to, is to be this hub for uh, work around collective intelligence as a method, a methodology that governments should become platforms for. And, you know, so I think it, it, there's a, a place where these lines may intersect later, um, you know, but with what you're doing with Open Global Mind. That's extremely, oh, Jimmy, do you mind connecting me to them? Yeah, yeah, I think I have, and you probably don't remember, but that's okay. Shit. Okay, sorry about that, man. Stephen Boucher, Boucher, B-O-U-C-H-E-R, is sort of the intellectual driver, but uh, uh... yeah. It's nice for me. I, you know, I don't see, even see. I don't have. Not in your brain. Shea. He's not in my brain, which means that um, had you had you meant the moment you the moment I had seen that I would have added him and started sort of looking him up and stuff. So really cool. Yeah, yeah. Small seeds. You never know where they're gonna. You know, really. Yeah. Make. You have yeah. to keep trying. Well, and the the open global mind thing is is growing in really interesting ways. Um, so I. I I am now a fiscal sponsee of a 501c3 called Lionsburg, which I've been in conversation with for five months, four months, something like that. Uh, and I think I mentioned here steward ownership as a, as a process. And so um, let me repeat it. So uh, the guy who founded Lionsburg is, uh, he comes out of construction. His last name is Sukut. He, he, he was this, he's the CEO of Sukut Construction and Rock Force Construction. If you wanted to build a new mall or a housing tract and needed to level the land, you bring these people in. And they're really good at that. And some 10 years ago, he had a crisis of conscience. He was like, I'm a good project manager. I love doing this, but I, I'd like to do something that actually helps the world. So he then did a bunch of research. And for the last five years, he's been going around like researching models that are sustainable, uh, that feed the commons, that help people sort of achieve their highest goal, their highest purpose in life. Um, and he, he found an old model that he decided is like really what he'd love to foster, which is steward ownership is what it's called. The Zeiss Foundation in Germany is steward owned. Um, and uh, that means that there's a foundation that owns all of the shares of a corporation. And by doing this, you take two ugly forms of, of organization, at least to me ugly, but you harness the predatory instincts of the C Corp to the purpose of the, the charity. And so, uh, and so all of a sudden you have a platform on which you can build, you can have a foundation that's doing open source software, you can have a for benefit, you can do a bunch of other different sorts of things. And, and Jordan is tugging a series of small entities like OGM, like Open Global Mind into these waters of steward ownership. And we just completed the first step a couple of weeks ago which allows me to go seek grant funding for OGM, which is a, a process I'm in the middle of right this second. Um, I have a conversation later today with Tom Gruber, some of you know Tom Gruber, uh, where I'm saying like, dude, I'm having trouble explaining this thing to people. Can you help me out? Um, uh, because I'm unclear sort of what the, what the long-term business model is, but I know exactly what the short-term things are to sort of stand up uh, the sharing of information of the kinds that we're talking about just before I jumped in with this, which is like, we have vaccine solutions, we have uh, Civic Hall Brussels, we have, you know, and the whole notion of collective intelligence is like right in the middle of our sweet spot. Uh, like how to do that and, and like, what, what are the aspects that lead to, uh, the, the other phrase that I love is collaborative sense-making. So collective intelligence, collaborative sense-making are kind of neighbors to me. Um, they, they may or may not be interchangeable. I haven't really worked the semantics of them, but they both attract a bunch of people who know that, that like what we all know together, like there's a title of a book, if, if only we knew what we know, right? And we don't. And any of you who've ever done work in knowledge management, like maybe Susan uh, and Mark and others, like, like you know that we don't know what we know. Go ahead, Susan. You are muted. There is that. There is that. Um... Yeah, I was in the knowledge management <laughs> circles for a, a long time, um, even though I didn't think of knowledge as a substance or something that you could own. But anyway, um, the, my, my reply, that was Carlo Odell. Um, yes. And uh, <clears throat> my reply to that, <clears throat> and we, for a while we would appear together occasionally on, on some talk circuit or other. And it was, <laughs> it was said, I said, if we only knew how we knew what we know. Yep. And that was that was sort of the side of the whole, the sort of a, a stepping stone to, you know, the, the processes are social as much as they are anything else. 
and what are the nature of those dynamics, blah, blah, blah. Um, any part of it that really appeals to you or really sort of fits your model of, of the world? Like, sh should I read the book? Is there some stuff in there or contact Carla? Um, <clears throat> um, I, think, I think that what the title, the title says it all, uh -huh. <laughs> frankly. And, uh, and it was mostly a plea to remember that uh, it, everything, we have known so much of this so much of the time, right? That that uh, we don't we don't call on it. We don't. Our first instinct is not when we have an idea is who else thought of this? What did they do? As you perfectly know, <laughs> and uh, that this has been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries and millennia. So, uh, yeah, no, probably not. <laughs> Anybody else on this? I want to ask a question about OGM. I mean, I yeah, thought please. there was a Rexy thing, a Rexy observation in OGM, um, but maybe I don't understand what Rexy is anymore. I was going to ask about that, and then I thought, no, we don't really. I want think it's that. mutated, and we're in a strange variant now, an evil variant. That's we're not in an evil variant. <laughs> Darn it! This is just okay. the way things are. Okay, okay. so um, the it's uh, not a variant. <laughs> <laughs> This is not broken. It's working exactly as it was intended. No, it's not working as intended. Nothing works as it intended. Oh, uh, good point. Minute, you know, yeah, sorry. So um, uh, there was a Rex, I had a Rexy moment in a, I sort of lurk on the sidelines of OGM and I read the messages from every now and then. And I saw, uh, I think it might've been Klaus. If it wasn't Klaus, it was a Klaus-like person. Mm -hmm. And uh, who said, um, haven't we learned that none of, that there is no model for sort of you know ginormous change, you know that you can't sort of just sort of declare, and we're all wondering why it doesn't happen. And I'm thinking, well, of course it doesn't. I mean, if if you look at how things work socially, you can see why it wouldn't. And well, so I think this is a really big discuss big big topic. So can you unpack it a little bit? Uh. Well, if you look at, <clears throat> again, to go back at, you know, if you have a, an anthropologist sensibility, which I, I earned, I did not, <laughs> I was not given it. You didn't just do the box top, the box tops. No, I didn't. And I didn't, I didn't. And it was always embarrassing because people would think I was an anthropologist because I was talking on behalf of anthropology or a certain kind of anthropology. And it was, it's like, no, just because I, I like it doesn't mean I am one or that I think is the only way to do things or that I think it drives me crazy. That's part of the same either or mindset. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> yeah, I think if you look, if you, if you take a look at how, how, how change moves, right? Uh, and then I, only once ever in, in, in my entire career actually was able to emulate <laughs> the way I thought it should work. And it did, uh, uh, it did work um, instigating or whatever a, a particular kind of change is that it does move just the way we're moving, just the way we're moving now. We, we connect each other to people, we connect ideas to other ideas. We, you know, it's, the, it's that, that dynamic is one of many right. that actually moves, moves things around. And they do, they have to be put into practice. That's, that's the thing. And um, the people who have the ideas are seldom the people who are any good at putting it in practice. And the people who put it in practice are dismissive of the people who have the ideas. And so it's not terribly happy. Mm -hmm. um, and that is broken, um, could be fixed, I think. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But, and this can't be orchestrated or what's the implication on whether change can be brought, large scale change can be brought about or managed or instigated, or I don't know what the right word is. Is it, it well? <clears throat> I think it's hard to explain, and thank you for asking. Um, I think it's because, um, <coughs> excuse me, I haven't talked yet this morning. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> precisely. Um, and I think that that. Well, let me slow down. There's something about the way change happens, it does happen and it spreads like wildfire. You know, ways of doing things and it goes, and we've talked about as a going viral, but I don't know that we understand the dynamics of that and what the underlying conditions are that make that, that cause that to happen. 
if you start to look for them, they seem to be various. Mm. We already know them. So we know the phenomenon, <clears throat> the phenomenon can, can take place. Uh, but the barriers to its spreading are, are social boundaries. They are, um, I once had a model uh, that had, um, I think it was about eight or 10 dimensions of the, of the, uh, of what it would be to <clears throat> try to build a management measurement system <laughs> mm -hmm. about social coherence, okay? And the, the, to break it down into certain kinds of things like, um, you know, time dimensions and place dimensions and, you know, how did you, you know, how, how cohesive was it, mm -hmm. right? You know, because a gang is extremely effective and extremely cohesive, but on the other, on many other dimensions undesirable. Mm -hmm. I mean, pir pirates were amazingly um, structured and democratic in different ways. Like if you if you read Under the Black Flag or a bunch of other books about the age of the, you know the golden age of pirates, they they had insurance. They had a whole bunch of interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's not you know, and four hundred one k programs. Oh, Pardon? totally, totally. You could you could you could do like uh, donor advised funds, the whole thing. Twenty <laughs> years of piracy, and then you know. Retirement. Oh, Jamey, that's brilliant. <laughs> Jamey, that's totally brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, talk to the pirates. I don't know. There still are pirates, you know. You know, September 19th, I think, is Talk Like a Pirate Day. Oh, yeah? Let's, yeah. Schedule, let's schedule one of these calls for that day. Exactly. Arr. I don't know uh, pirate talk. Oh, I'll keel haul you. You wear a parrot. You get an eye patch. Uh, you, you talk in blustery kind of uh, uh, nautical English, British accent. I don't know. Oh. Sodomy, pirate. <laughs> Sodomy in the pirate tradition. <laughs> the, a first printing is available for $1,000. Damn. Yes, right. First edition so printing. An, an old a yes. historian friend long ago told me that, that in the British Navy, like sodomy was commonplace. Like this is how men entertained themselves while at sea and it wasn't punished. Uh, and then, and then attitudes towards homosexuality changed sharply, and I've forgotten why and when. And suddenly, everything got stigmatized. But you know, ancient Greece, uh, British Navy, lots of lots of places. Actually, there wasn't consistent. Oh, there, was, there was a recent CBC Ideas program on uh, Da Vinci's sexuality, and it, it seems at the time he was living, uh, things were more gay, let's say, but sodomy was still taboo. So, you know, the kind of affection people felt for each other was much more, you know, explicitly expressed. Interesting. But I want to say about- yeah, Smile has uh, been my understanding. Go ahead, Jim. Please, go. Well, I was going to switch back to punctuated equilibrium or change. Yeah. And, and I recently found out that uh, there was a period called the Boring Billions or the Boring Billion. It was a billion year period in the Earth's history when there were only unicellular organisms. And it turns out the reason was that the oxygen level in the atmosphere was in this kind of intermediate zone where it wasn't very low, which would have been okay, or wasn't very high. It was just at the right level to kind of suppress development, which just shows how, you know, conditions, well, condition things, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so others on change. Anyway, and... oh, one more, one yeah. more thing there. Is Go ahead. I, the, the one conclusion I came to was, uh, that seemed do something to do was to make sure that those conditions you put those conditions in place, right? Right. And if you know if, what they are, yeah. If you know what they are, but take a small example, um, which I'm reminded by by a call I just got off of <clears throat> about the the thing about workplace, and you know you can't work with anthropologists for very long without discovering that you know that they. They know they are very observant about the physical layout of things as well as the social layout of things and how they come together and uh, fall apart and all the rest of that. So the um, so that's why I took <laughs> the Institute for Research on Learning mm, off on this long journey, mm, not long enough, but long journey to uh, to explore what were the you know physical attributes of place that fostered learning. The social dimensions of learning, and um, 
did that turn into research papers or books or anything sort of other artifacts you left know, behind it, that quest? It sort, of, it sort of did, but it was all client work. Oh. I would say that all of our enormous amounts of intellectual capital were in the project proposals. Damn, I mean, damn client work because most of it is private and doesn't make it into the legacy bin anywhere. I know, I know. That, I mean, I'm living with that legacy, that non-legacy. Yeah. It, right now. Yeah. And, um, so it was refreshing to, I was the, Herman Miller was talking to a, one of the future of work groups that I <clears throat> stay connected to. And, um, and they were right on this sort of workplace thing. And, and they did start with noticing, look, people have been working in <laughs> these hybrid ways for at least the last 15 years, ever since we got the internet and we had that, that kind of connection. Um, of course, before that we had couriers, but um, the, uh, the observation was still that the physical place mattered. Mm -hmm. So that was, the, and that was where it was really fun to experiment with um, different configurations of space and different, we developed a, a practice-based, um, a practice-based community design system. And um, go ahead. that was put into practice, right? Yeah. But you lose track of these things. You lose control of them. You don't know. Yeah. And if you don't have a large enough organization to insert yourself in or get them to do the right metrics and promise to share them with you, it's gone. And I think that's true of many, many of these successful efforts. Yeah, yeah. And just to riff on what you're saying, um, how do you capture or do you capture or how do you represent the different qualities of the same space in different communities? Meaning a white barbershop really different from a black barbershop. And sort of hair, hair salons in black culture for men and for women are gigantic social connecting places yeah. where a lot of information changes hands, where relationships are made, et cetera. Uh, not yeah, typical. Yeah, you should not always typical. take your spouse to your hairdresser. Yeah. Oh, you don't want them to learn all those secrets, do you? Oh, well, I don't know. It might help. <laughs> yeah, it might actually be good therapy. Um, anyway, but, uh, it's a different kind of therapy. So. Um, well, like bartenders. Yeah, but I think that's because we don't, uh, you do have to get down to a certain grain size mm -hmm. of how it is that um, the place supports. Well, I prefer to go in work first, right? <laughs> I wanna see how they get their work done. Out of that, out of that emerge some generalizations, right? That are maybe not terribly helpful, uh, but they do elucidate, they illuminate actually mm -hmm. the differences in how the people are in those and what the practice the, the social practice and the actual haircutting practice and everything else, how those things mesh together in one place. Because we right. forget that at, to get work done, it's the person doing the work and the community doing the work or the institution doing the work or whatever it is. That's the point where all of the resources come together. They have to all be present. If they're not there, it's ready to hand. Or if it's not ready to hand, you have to go get it. You have to, you know, what's, you can watch people have to go get things. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you can see how intricately they're designed. And the, the fact that the social dimensions are different, I mean, one could do, probably has been, well, no, probably hasn't been done, is to compare the two and see how, uh, to see how, how, where the differences lie. Right. And I think a piece of preparing the spaces for generativity, mm -hmm. I can project a bit on, on the conversation, um, has a lot to do with cultural assumptions and then uh, com com societal assumptions or narratives that sort of float in the background. So one of the, one of the questions is in the back of my head is, how do we like how do we hit the magic button to switch most people from thinking like Homo economicus, and if only I if only I act in my greedy self interest, the invisible hand will make it all work out, and if only we had perfect markets for everything, everything would be fine. Damn it! So why can't those pesky liberals get out of the way? Um, over to hey, we're interdependent co-inhabitants of this pale blue dot, which is pretty fragile. And if we saw ourselves as interdependent, we would then be able to collaborate in a different way. And then there's this other neighboring narrative about intellectual property where my goal is to invent things and then lock them away for my personal benefit and society will benefit because they will buy the thing that I did as opposed to as we make breakthroughs, how do we share those breakthroughs so that the idea propagates and can cause change and you know change for good? And, and those are those are like intertwined contexts. 
Yeah. And for me, I'm trying to create generative spaces. So one of the things that sprang out of recent Open Global Mind conversations was a little side project we have to create a generative commons agreement. <clears throat> because we were sitting talking, we, we were, I, I was busy like looking at the memorandum agreement with Lionsburg and the legal section that came from their very, very, very smart and kind lawyer was very old school. Yeah. And we were like, we don't want this. We want something that's looking forward about how do, how do we collaborate? And then how does somebody who owns IP sort of step into this conversation and preserve some rights over their IP? What do they need to mark or label or, or, or declare? But how do we work with a general intention to always improve the comments to make that this sort of ongoing assumption? And how do we do that under a regime where anything, any expression is automatically by default copyrighted because of the freaking copyright regime we have in the world that the you know that started in the US and that the WTO and WIPO have basically foisted on everybody. So, so you have to almost defensively uh, do stupid yeah. things yeah. in order to survive that gauntlet. But, but, we're, but, but part of the generative commons agreement is like, we love creative commons. They've done a really nice job with copyright and they have a bunch of very explicit, easy to use by, by CCNA, whatever. Uh, and that's great. So we include that by reference. But what about the rest of it? And then what about when you're stepping into a sphere, something, something more about intent, generative intent, uh, things like that. So that, that's the goal of this little generative commons uh, agreement project is to explore that space and figure out what to do. If you're interested, we're starting, starting to meet on uh, Wednesday mornings at seven. Uh, this morning, uh, what, there was a confusion. So it wasn't that topic, but it'll start next week. It'll continue next week, um, but 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 that's all in all in the interest of the mission you just described, Susan. Which is how do we create spaces? This being an intellectual yeah. virtual space, yeah. but how do we create generative spaces? How do we how do we create spaces that lean toward uh, these kinds of shared collective intelligent outcomes? So if you um, and if you look back to uh, I don't know what traditions you're looking back at to to see where that's been accomplished. The only ones I can think of, first one that comes to mind is the uh, is the Amish the Amish tradition. Of um, I mean, recently there read, I read a piece on um, uh, how it was that that actually they do accept technology. It's just that they come to a collective agreement in the community, and usually it's small scale. Is uh, is whether or not it's going to help the commons, mm -hmm. and then they will say yes. You can buy a tractor. Right. It's uh, funny. Um, a, a side story, but I think it's relevant. Uh, mayor Park, who committed suicide later, but the mayor of Seoul uh, was a huge fan of the sharing economy, mm -hmm. and the city of Seoul did a whole bunch of stuff around the sharing economy. And when April went to talk to them, and she was invited to be on the, their advisory committee, so she saw, she saw a lot of this. Um, the reason they did all that was not to improve the ecology of the city, was not to save money, was not even to sort of share their resources more effectively. The actual ulterior motive is to build community. Yeah, yep. And all the other benefits were great benefits, love those other benefits, but their, their objective was actually to, to rebuild community. But the, the community of practice idea, I mean, underlying that, people get so entranced by the notion of community and they want to build communities and they want to have communities. And, oh, community practice, I want one, you know? Yeah. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, is, is the point of view is, the point is that it takes practice and it's a sustained practice. You know, there has been this long tradition. Um, who was it? One of the Harvard Divinity School people. Uh, who, who, who sort of came up with the, the idea that religion was, the, that the rig, religion was really a practice. It wasn't a belief system. Hmm. And there is, there is certainly one theologian who happens to be my former partner, Brian's father, hmm. uh, that- um, Is it any of these people? Peter Gomes? No, Peter it's a woman. Hoffman. Okay, Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza, Angie no, Thurston? No, she may not be there any longer. Darn. Well, this is just, just this is only, anyway. the, this is not the entire roster of faculty right, at the exactly. school. Anyway, so yeah, it's one of those little books, you know, the sort of paperback size, but has a hard cover, uh -huh. light blue cover. Well, anyway, one of those. It'll come to you. And uh, no, maybe, or maybe not. Or maybe not. It's upstairs, I know where it is on the bookshelf. Oh, perfect. Uh, so um, <clears throat> I just don't have, live in my house anymore. I'd run and get it. Um, 
so yeah. So anyway, so her so her point was, and I I have a good Jewish friend who uh, um, very good friend who um, we have talked over the years over and over again about what it is to be religious and the notion of practice. And, you know, it's like, I remember, perhaps I've said this story, but I remember when I was 13 and told my, probably said it recently, been on my mind a lot. I said, I didn't feel like going to church. And he says, oh, sometimes I don't either. I thought, well, then why do you go? I said, why do you go? <laughs> he said, otherwise there wouldn't be a community. Mm, that's lovely. Mm -hmm. That's really lovely. Uh, uh, I remember, go I remember, ahead, Bob. Uh, speaking of intellectual property abuse thereof, um, as you know, I grew up partly on a farm, so I know what being on a farm is like. So uh, John Deere is having problems with, uh, with farmers because, um, of course, they've stuck sensors in and uh, you know, computerized um, you know, ignition systems. And so if, I'll just give this one example. It was on NPR, and it just made me want to scream. Uh, so the farmer's tractor stops, and, uh, and, you, and you, John Deere dealership has the only ability to diagnose the computer because it's their software, not his. Oh, yeah. So he has to turn in his $100,000 tractor. Now, mind you, the way farm equipment is, is it sits around, and then when you need it, you need it. And you basically have a two week window and you better get it done or it's game over. Yeah. So the dealership takes his tractor. It takes them a month to get around diagnosing that it's a fuel sensor. And then they charge him like five grand to tell him it's a fuel sensor. So you've got uh, legislators all over these farm states are actually now legislating. Yes, like, yes, no, yes. You cannot own the software. This is. No, this, this doesn't work. But this is, it's been taken, it's, this story has been around in various versions now for some years. Uh -huh. And it's, it's, it, it's still, I mean, still trying to be fixed. And the, another thing these farmers are doing, they're saying, okay, we're not gonna, we're gonna go find older tractors. We're not gonna buy tractors like this from you anymore. We're yeah. out, we opt out of your system. Um, so it's fascinating because you think, you think about it, it's, it's everything's through the cloud. It's, it's an intellectual product. It's a narrow view. Of, of intellectual property that makes it so the tractor isn't even doesn't even work for you. It's basically a rentier extraction object. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. that's a great name. Yeah. And so the right to repair is a big trope here and really important. And not much has happened around it <clears throat> that I can tell. Um, and then, the like, Sorry. yeah, exactly. And then, like between Monsanto and Deer, and probably a couple other companies I'm not thinking about, like. Being a farmer is really hard. And Mons I think Monsanto employees think they're saving the world by making more abundant food when in fact they're destroying like the earth. And I, I would love to figure out how to crawl inside the leader's brains and change what they're doing like wholesale. And they just got bought by Bayer. And I don't know if that was good or bad. Um, but, but Monsanto is one of the com companies in my brain that's like under like, why do people work here? Say, Bo, to, just to go back to the point you were making, though, with respect, can you could you expand the thinking into this business of the IP around the uh, the vaccines? I mean, Whoa. what what could possibly be the argument that we shouldn't share? Oh, I, I think the only thing I've heard about we shouldn't share is that um, the technical know-how to make and produce these vaccines is different than just the IP of that. So. Yeah. Um, that, that was the argument that the economists did, but I don't know if I completely buy it, but th their argument was, go ahead, you can undo the, the, that, but it's still going to be them producing it, and that's the hard part. Well, yeah, and that's true. I mean, we used to say, I used people said, you know, we don't, I remember <laughs> a partner, business partner once who said, well, we don't want to do this because they might take our ideas, and I'm going like, if they can take our ideas and put them into practice, hey, they're welcome to them. Yeah. Uh, so, Jerry, I've been meaning to have a dinner party with uh, my philosophy buddies, and I want you to be there as the Grand Inquisitor. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Do, I get, do I get to wear like a cloak and a hood? Yeah, exactly. A, you need a new costume. And a hair to, shirt? You get to sit at the end of the table, and, uh, and I, well, I'm going to set it up so that they all, we all know that that's what you're there for. Can I put people to the torch? I mean, really, like, if you're going to let me do this, you got to give me some leeway. <laughs> Uh, well, to the intellectual torch, you're welcome to. I've always wanted to know more about autos da fe. 
because I mean, we're having a good time uh, going through the whole Catholic Church history, and you know, we are always talking history. And we're auditing basically the last three thousand years. Awesome! I, I love that. You would, you would enjoy. It. <laughs> you need Jerry. You need Jerry. He'll keep you on your toes. And back back to Susan's questions about how change happens. I have a whole bunch of narrative I can do that's collected in my brain that I can I could do a screencast. I haven't yet about. The 1964 law, Goldwater's loss in 64 turns into a whole rethinking of the Republican Party, turns into the creation of the Hoover Institute, the AEI, a whole bunch of academic institutions and the hiring of a bunch of smart people to build an intellectual basis, the purchasing of AM radio and talk radio and all of that, like a whole series of planned long, long, long-term thinking that understood psychology and all that, that turned into, I have, I have a thought I'll share, which is like, how Republicans basically took over the agenda. And it was planned, it was smart, it was really, really slow long-term thinking and it worked. And right this minute, right this minute, two idiots in the Senate are, are very effectively holding back a giant program to try to fix things. Um, and I don't know what the workaround is. I don't know, I know how to get there, but I can paint a picture of how we got to this impasse. And, and it, it's not that one person said, let's all go do this. But there was a general consensus that, that worked through uh, how that worked. I would bet, I'd really, if I had any money, I'd put some money down that, um, that the actual, uh, that the group was very tightly socially connected. I mean, in those days, politics was much, a much smaller, yeah. a smaller kind of phenomenon. And people were deeply, deeply connected. So if you got a bunch together, then you really could make things happen. Um, the fact that one or two people can hold the entire Congress hostage strikes me as bizarre, but it's happening. Well, this happened and, and, uh, in, in Israel, Bibi is holding Israel hostage right now. Go ahead, Dave. And still, even though he's not the prime minister. Right. Well, well I, I guess I've been trying to play the other side of this a little bit and just trying to understand it. and. A little bit of a non sequitur, but I mean, why why are we seeing an increase in murders in cities all across the, city, the country? Because right? because lockdown is over, and we hadn't fixed the problem before. No, murder rate was up prior to lockdown being over. Right, that's right. No, no, no. But, the murder rate was way out of hand before lockdown, and we hadn't dealt with that. We didn't do anything. Well, about the it. reason is because now people are gathering together, and you can kill bunches of them. No, right. I don't think that's it. I no? think that the. I'm on a different list where this has been debated for a while. <laughs> um, crime is down except for murder mm -hmm. um, during the pandemic. And the interpretation is that there are fewer eyes on the street. And as a result, the, the murder rate goes up because there are less bystanders that would interfere with somebody feeling like they could do this. Huh. Um, and that makes sense to me. Um, the other thing is obviously huge social deprivation, creating a tremendous amount of tension. Um, I'm glad, who raised this, Bo? Nope. Um, oh no, oh, it was David. David. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because it felt to me like when Jerry, you know, sort of primed this meeting, the what now, like as we emerge is really, really important. I'm living, I mean, I'm not in New York at the moment, but we're probably going to elect a anti-crime former Republican, former black cop as our next mayor. At least that's what the polling suggests right now. And it's the, the interpretation is that it's fear of crime mm -hmm. <laughs> because there has been a, a, a bump up in murders some of them the random kind that, you know, when it's a bystander who gets shot and others related to gangs and a, a backlash coming from the outer boroughs. Uh, ranked choice voting doesn't seem to be helping either. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, what does it say if New York elects Eric Adams, um, you know, who's positioned himself very well to take advantage of this? Um, and in general, the idea that we're emerging from deprivation into needs that haven't been met, um, and you know, the the fact that people need touch, the fact that people need, you know, to see each other physically, um, and that some of that's beginning to be met. Um, 
I, I find this a very confusing period, to be honest. Um, and I was kind of going, I was going a little bit the direction that Bo's taking this stuff with the idea of stresses. I mean, I kind of wonder if we need some kind of a, a, a temperature reading for society, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like society has a fever. And it's so we need like an anal thermometer for society. I, I think that that's really the only way to get the information we're going to need. Okay. And right, I mean, we're seeing the rapidity of change makes people nervous is one way to kind of I'd interpret it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so the Trump phenomena is a reaction to the rap rapidity of change, right? And, and we're not through it yet. And so if, if our goal is, well, let's get faster change, I do right. think there is a pushback, you know, at some point, something happens in the in the corpus of the society that you know um, our heart bursts or something i don't know would be what the what is the matter changing, changing the way you do things collectively is hard work and it's slow oh and it makes people very anxious yes yep. and yep. that anxiousness is i think what we're seeing and we've had a big disruption several big disruptions and they're happening around the world right again it's just like why why would this be happening all around the world at the same time there's, you know, something else is going on that's hard to, hard to interpret. Well, I think we may have hit the, I, no, we haven't talked about, well, I don't know if we need another topic, but. Oh, go for it. <laughs> well, population growth um, and the fact that we're reaching, it reminds me of those early ecological studies in which, you know, too many deer on the island and they start to do themselves in. Um, and I feel like there's too many people on the planet. And so, but, but most, right? but most. <laughs> And, and climate change together are putting yeah. huge pressure on the system, which it can't handle. But actually most developing countries are, un, are depopulating. Um, like South Korea has the world's lowest uh, fertility rate, which is 0.92, replacement is 2.1. Uh, Africa is going to double in population in That's the next 10 I mean. years. I mean, it's doing, but, it's but, doing. But, but only Africa is going to double in the next 10 years. Everything else is gonna like skinny out. So do those people migrate out? Latin America is also going to explode because their fertility rates are pretty high. But everywhere else is actually facing a population crisis. Right, oh, depending on how you define it. Yes. I mean, I, I think that this is people, people, you know, like the deer on the island sort of becoming infertile <laughs> or choosing to be, or, you know, just, just sort of saying like, enough, can't handle it. It's like the, the pushback, apparently. Uh, in China when they put in the new three-child policy and people say, I can't handle three children. I can't handle any children. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm just interested how any, like, how do y'all feel about the population thing? Jamei, I'm sure you've studied this a while. Are we heading toward population doom? Is this going to level out? Like, Well, the, the, the if you look at the, the trajectory of societies, it tends to be towards a decreasing uh, population growth as they become um, more technologically and economically wealthy. Right. Um, the you know, and most importantly, as women take on a greater role in um, social and cultural power, which is also linked to that's girl, actually girls, the girls' education. Is a huge, is huge, yeah. in Afghanistan. huge variable here. Yeah. Not education. Right. In developmental economics, so, um, people who are in poor countries basically, social security is having kids. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's yeah. why yeah. the pattern that we was talking about is, has held for a long, long time. Just go on, Jimmy. I know yep. So the question is will the arc of population change start to decline globally? before we hit the limits of what we can support as a planet undergoing a climate disaster. Um, and that's very uncertain. I'll say, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think you could I have said asked, any, I, I don't think there are too many sentences you could have put together that would be more uncertain at this moment, but go ahead. Right. I was actually asked a number of years ago to write a short thing for a uh, New York Times bit about population. And, you know, and I said, look, if we if we ha can feed and and support a planet of 10 billion people by the end of the century that means we've actually succeeded as a planet because the way things look now we're never going to get to that population because people are going to start dying of starvation 
And so, and I got a lot of pushback for that because it was just not the framing that people were looking for. But, you know, getting to 10 billion people would be a sign of overall success because that means we can, we can support people up to that point. Uh, anyway, so I'm, uh, I do find the population curves an interesting, an interesting thing to look at. The, there, that has so, so many issues. I mean, one of the big crises that China is about to go into is that they have an even more unbalanced demographic than um, Japan? the United States, mm -hmm. certainly, um, in terms of having an, an older population. And they have not historically had a meaningful social security set system. No, type it's, system. it's shocking. You um, to the wrong a lot, province and it's over. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. A lot of the, um, if you remember, there, there's a wave of building, uh, you know, building cities that were empty uh, in China. A lot of that was basically money going into ghost cities as a, as a form of investment so that ostensibly they'd be able to have money come back from for retirement. That's why we're getting all this, the, uh, the richer folks in China buying up land in California and Vancouver and mm -hmm. Washington and Oregon. Um, it's, that's basically trying to deal with a, a retirement. Um, and so I don't know if this is, is this is form, foremost on Winnie the Pooh's mind, but this is cer certainly something that's going to be a, an increasing challenge for the Chinese leadership uh, over the next decade or two, you know, how to deal with a, with a dramatically unbalanced demographically and economically population in a way that doesn't cause further um, global tension or f further tension in internally and then by extension globally mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah there's just just so much yeah you know, China China's getting getting busy in the uh, uh, on its territorial edges the the it's the increasing threats towards Taiwan. Um, everyone saw John Cena's abject apology for having implied that Taiwan was a country mm -hmm. and he had to apologize in Mandarin. Um, it's just, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, before I forget, the anecdote around people working in jobs, why, why did they work there? Um, I had the, the pleasure of... Uh, organizing trips to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories back in the 80s uh, when I worked for the Adelaide Stevenson program on nuclear policy at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and so I got a, several opportunities to sit and talk with nuclear physicists at Lawrence Livermore back and that was back in the, the Reagan era of money going into SDI, money going into modernizing uh, nuclear weapons. And I actually got a chance to ask, why do you do this? I mean, because in many cases, they recognize that there was um, at best moral ambiguity about what they were doing. Um, and some of them acknowledge that, that if, they're, if what they built, what they designed ever used, it would be horrific. They did it because they got to do cool science that they couldn't do anywhere else. Oh, man. And I bet you that that is what's going on at Monsanto, that you oh, have, you have engine, uh, bioengineers and Genetic yeah. technicians who are able to do cool science with a level of funding, a level of institutional support they could get nowhere else. Yeah. And if your primary goal is to do cool science and not to think about the implications or to deal with the implications, that's somebody else's job, or it's just too big for me to worry about, or I don't know how this is actually going to work out. All I, all I know is what I hear. So I'm just going to focus on what I know. AI um, included. And yeah, you you throw in, you know, AI would be something along those lines. Anyone who does anything around on the military around face recognition, um, you know, there's just there's a whole whole range of of um, scientific endeavors that are really cool, just from a narrow point of view, from that from that narrowly focused perspective, mm -hmm. that have all sorts of enormous and problematic implications. But for people who want to do the cool science, this is where you go to do the cool science. And so I think that's that's why people work at Monsanto. That's why people work in a lot of these problems. But isn't that true also of engineers who want to build sure. cool things? Yeah. 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 You, you get to do things that you couldn't do anywhere else that would be that are spectacular or provocative or or yeah. groundbreaking, hopefully, you know, sometimes literally. 
Um, so, yeah, you know, exactly. A AI and, and engineering, it's, it's all about being able to do something cool and not allowing yourself to look outside that narrow frame. Mm -hmm. Well, it's about personal, I mean, personal identity is very strong and professional no. identity is huge, right? And they're egos that require stroking. Is there, when we have well, that, that, sounds, that actually sounds more, Hold on a more dismissive. That actually sounds more dismissive than, than I mean it. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Um, oh, you know, it, okay. Egos being, it, it, yeah, maybe there's an ego being stroked there, but it's really just that, that, self, that sense of self-actualization. Yeah. They get to do something that nobody else or very few other people get to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that, although I would say that to the degree that professions have developed some level of ethical codes, um, you get some barriers. So, you know, mm -hmm. in the medical field, you do, there is controversy at least about, you know, uh, doctors who are in the pay of pharmaceutical companies and at the same time, you know, prescribing the, the drugs that they are in effect, you know, being paid to endorse. Um, I think in the field of AI, we don't have that. I mean, the, the nuclear physicists after the bomb was created did go through a process, at least partially, of, you know, uh, <laughs> what's the work that we want to do and what's the work that we shouldn't do? Um, and I, it feels like some of this was starting a few years ago in the tech sector. Uh, it's yet one more thing that feels like it got interrupted by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, which raises an interesting question of, do these things come back or do they get forgotten? Um, but, uh, uh, you know, part of the tech lash was a infusion of funding into efforts to build ethical tech, responsible tech. Uh, you know, those, those are at least organizationally things that have some, a little bit of traction. I don't really have a feel for whether, uh, that's going to come back twice as strong now or, or be forgotten. Mm -hmm. But once you're in a setting like a Monsanto where all your peers are, you know, where you're not exposed to a mm -hmm. dissenter or, and your field doesn't, but aren't they under pressure at least in some ways with, you know, the, the anti GMO movement? I mean, I don't really know. I, I think you're right about, in general, that this is a well. They've been fighting this this battle against activists forever, like yeah. like really forever. Which, which I think, which I think only hardens you. Yeah, it exactly. like it like it's like well, we're screwed no matter what we do. Right. It just hardens your resolve into the current strategy, kinda. Yeah, until, also until, some of these people are are kind of crazy, and it only reinforces that we're the smart ones. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Bo, you want to jump in? Oh, I was just saying. Um, when, when we have the philosophy group, you know, science uh, empiricism can't make ethics. Yeah. Mm. And it's because empiricism doesn't give you ethics. It's always ex post. Okay, what are we going to optimize for? Oh, human beings, well, it, it, they can't do ethics. And it, you can't derive ethics from empiricism, which is scientific truth, is empiricism. It's a constant problem. Yeah. Well, that's a showstopper. Yeah, I don't know if that's true, but it's not something that I think we can work out uh, in the next 25 minutes. We um, can try. Well, it's because I think that there is, you know, one of the way I am not a theist. Yeah, I haven't been for a very long time, but I do think that I have a comparatively, you know, a relatively strong sense of, of ethics around around the planet. And I realize that a lot of it comes from what I perceive as a um, a perspective, an evolutionary perspective, not in a Darwinian, uh, social Darwinism perspective by any means, but in the sense of what can be, can we, can we do to enable the further proliferation and you know, healthy proliferation of life on the planet? Do, do the choices I make uh, allow for greater healthy uh, development and spread of life? Um, uh, on this planet, unless uh, you humans, think that too much life is going to overpopulate us and kill us, but but yes, but the, but even then, I said, what are the choices I make? And life as a 
planetary whole, not necessarily mm -hmm. of any one species. Right. Um, although not trying to uh, to go after, you know, minimize any one species necessarily. And so I'm not anti-human. I'm not a, you know, zero population activist. Um, although I have written scenarios along those lines where people leave the Earth as a uh, um, the the scenario that I wrote for uh, National Park Service for their centennial a few years back. I talk about, well, let's look out 100, 500 years. Um, people have left the earth as a global park, um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, oh, I like it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I described it as you know, we, leave the, we leave the earth as a, as a park uh, I, I, and either as an untouched and letting things go as they may or try to pull back all the human influence or impacts on the planet, but we spread. As it is, it's a, a growing sphere um, of DNA and mind centered on Earth, which is, you know, not abandoned, not ignored, but celebrated. So you have just headed towards something that really interests me that I haven't explored enough, which is I have a belief that long ago we used to know how to take care of nature, and how to man manage landscapes and live together off the landscape. If you go to Australia, if, if you go to Northern South America, the, the you know, huge portions of the landmass were actually managed. It's just that it didn't look like farming and ranching to Europeans when they showed up. So they ignored it and then destroyed it. Um, and so, so there's kind of this, oh shoot, where was I heading? Uh, oh, so when we create parks, we evacuate all the humans off the parks, which means we drive Native Americans off the choice lands because the park is the prettiest part of the land. And my belief is we should have some other category, which is like smart humans who know how to collaborate with, with land, we want them living on this land because humans that know what they're doing are really good for the land, right? And what we've done is we've created these sanctuaries where we, we've created wilderness areas where there can be no human habitation. It's like, I'm sorry, that's just stupid. No, you're, you're well, Mika's right that it, that's park service staff because if you're, if you're talking, talking about having- They're not the same. <laughs> You're, well, you want to make a so you want to make a zoo? No, for, not for at all. The native, for the no, natives. no, 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 you no. You no. basically have the enclosed I, place of it, it's like it's like the uh, what is Lion Country Safari. I'm going to give you a it, reservation. Look, look, dear, I uh, had an Asani, you know, uh, con, uh, convention. I'm going to give you this crappy little piece of land that has no water, no anything. Or we would like you to be stewards of the most beautiful parts of our country. It's not a and zoo. That, that's a, that's a false dichotomy. Framing false it dichotomy, as a, Jerry. framing it as a zoo is a terrible thing. Well, but, but that's what you're that's what you're describing. I didn't say that you, at all. No, you didn't say it. I didn't imply it. it. I didn't intend yes. it. <laughs> Jerry, you're talking oh, about no. having, 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 what happens when we try to construct an ideal. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm just saying, Jamey. That not, this is how hard it is. This is real hard work, man. Of course, yeah. of course. But anybody else have strong feelings about parks, no parks, <laughs> humans, no humans, Native American tribes? Mika. Oh, I, I do oh, want to remember. In the, Amazon, in the Amazon, we do have efforts. One of my friends, Emily Jacoby, runs an organization called Digital Democracy that works with indigenous uh, villages in different parts of the Amazon on stewardship and, and community self-defense. Um, and they are dealing, they, they know their land very, very well and how to live off of it and not tear it all apart, right? So that they're in symbiosis. And their biggest challenge is uh, the extractive industries that are encroaching. Absolutely. Um, and one of the most interesting things about their work is um, they've worked with these communities to develop the, uh, indigenous tech skills. So the communities learn how to build and operate their own drones to map uh, their own areas. And they've developed a, a mapping tool and a mapping language uh, that is really rich for just describing um, the local fauna and flora. It's called Mapio. And um, they're very, very deliberate about not putting these maps up on the web. This is about, because maps are tools for colonial extraction. Uh -huh. um, and so what they're trying to do is, is protect the people in place before the 
the process that you're you know trying to to fix um, has happened, uh, and it, it's a wonderful group. Um, so do you, I have think, a link, do you have a link to Matthew? I'll find, I'll find one for you. Thanks. Um, so I think what you're saying is that the indigenous, the, the people who are infused with knowledge about how to, how to steward the land should be living on that land rather than it's just there for tourists and hikers. Bing. Nice. Uh, precisely. And, yeah. and don't forget how I, I'm, there's this wonderful um, video that this guy here in Oregon did about our forests and, uh, the, the 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 Native Americans would periodically burn it. They never let it get as bad as it is right now. This, I can I can send you hundreds of books. And he had pictures like here's the picture 1900. Look, yeah. here's yeah. the picture now. And you're like, ooh, looks like we Europeans don't know and, how to manage things very well. Look at that. So well, brief is the forest. The Forest Service is very has been very adamant internally about the need to allow fires, but they know that it just doesn't work politically. I actually worked on worked on a scenario project for the Forest Service around fires, wildland fires, and they're desperate internally to figure out how to tell the story of the need for fires, you know, in a society where the political leaders and the economic leaders don't want to see that happen. So a brief and they're the ones who control the funding. A brief informational aside before we turn to the Jewish space lasers. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a book called The Mushroom at the End of the World. Uh, by Anna Lohenhout Singh, which is really like charming and insightful. And she talks about the Matsutake mushroom. And it turns out that in the seventies, the Japanese have kind of over farmed Matsutake, which they love. Uh, they've over farmed them in Japan. They're looking around for sources. It turns out there's a whole bunch of um, Asian, uh, Eastern Asian refugees in the US who know how to subsist in the forest and so they wind up going into the forests of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest and, and finding uh, <clears throat> Matsutake. And then there's a, a, a group of middlemen who wind up being sort of the, they, they buy up, the, the, the foragers sell to the middlemen who sell to, to Japan. And it, it all kind of works out. But at the beginning of the book, it says, the Pacific Northwest was mostly Ponderosa forest. And we logged it all out successfully. I don't know about all, but we logged out all the Ponderosa. And what grows after Ponderosa is lodgepole pine or fir. Ponderosa doesn't come back easily. And who loves the foot, the base of a 10 year old lodgepole pine? Matsutake mushrooms. So Matsutake, Matsutake thrive in damaged forests, which was like this, this layers, layers of things happening that, that, that were like, holy crap, that's like really, really interesting. Because if the ponderosas were still there, there probably wouldn't be matsutake. There'd be other mushrooms, whatever. But matsutake like just the lodgepole. They're they're happy at the at the roots of a lodgepole pine, a mature lodgepole pine. Um, and and then she like goes into the layers of economy that got created around this and how they're you know basically trying to make a marginal existence in the forests, etc. It's super super cool. Um, but that's just one of the you know many ingredients that are going on here. And and I wonder like walking distance from our home here in Portland is a, a plaque that says right here, there used to be a, a, a lumber museum or a lumber lodge or something. It was, it was a gigantic, um, almost like a cathedral. It wasn't, it wasn't a, any kind of religious thing, but it was made out of these beautiful, huge timbers. And there are a couple black and white photos you could find of, of it. Uh, and it's gone now. There's a condo uh, standing where the plaque is. Um, but, but that was, you know, that was there kind of as this monument to the, the ponderosas that were here that were just like there for the cutting. And all those ancient pictures of lumberjacks at the base of, uh, of a tree that's, that's, uh, wider than they are tall, you know, sometimes two X or like, damn. Uh, there's a great podcast called Timber Wars that, uh, Oregon Public Radio is doing, which was oh, wow. fascinating to read. And there was a very, not to listen to, and there was a very interesting moment when Bill Clinton came to town. And uh, they had all the forestry guys. Uh, and it was also interesting to hear the evolution within the Forest Service themselves. Uh, they were original, their original mission was to manage resources and to utilize those resources. And uh, essentially a bunch of very, very smart guys working in the Forest Service started figuring out like, hey, you know what, this really isn't. Mm. And so within the Forest Service, basically an intellectual like kernel of old growth and realizing it. and 
So Bill Clinton came to town and had a big old summit with them all in one room. And because they didn't even know what old growth forest they had in the Northwest. Uh, they, they didn't know. So they started doing maps on hotel room floors together and figuring it out. And it's really fascinating, Jerry. Maps really, are pretty useful. And maps it also was useful. really interesting is that you used to, uh, yeah, I tended to have a cartoon view about the loggers versus the forestry people and everything else. And it's such a complex intertwining of, of things going on. And you, cause you know, you when here in Oregon, you drive around, you see all these little towns that are just dead and you realize forestry ended, so they ended. And you could, but really understanding how the whole thing worked out uh, was really fascinating. And so these, these people even tried to work with those small towns and figure out a way, figure out ways so it's such a complex story. It just, but it's, it's a beautiful like farms. Story. It's like farms in the Midwest. I mean, that's all mines in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So if we could figure out how to have a regenerative mindset, we could remediate a lot of these things, but we would need a bunch of leeway on policy because mostly policy locks us out of being able to fix these things. There's just way too much legislation and structure poured in place that feels immovable that keeps us from making progress on a bunch of these things. But, but like, the, the, you know, the conversation we're having and all of its dynamics, and I just, I've been taking notes in my brain. So I did have Matthew on my brain, it turns out, but here's the mushroom at the end of the world. Here's Rick Perlstein. Uh, here's how conservatives took over the US agenda. I added the boring billion, which I didn't have, and now I need to map it into history. Um, but like in an hour and a half, we've just, you know, touched on a bunch of stuff that really kind of matters here. And, how do we liberate humans to fix these things? Because it's mostly, it's mindset and poured concrete in the form of poured concrete, but also legislation uh, that, 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 that keeps us from, from fixing this stuff. Give people a sense of the future. And that means giving people a sense of that they're not on the edge of d personal disaster. So people, my, people who people who feel like they're one paycheck away from from calamity. losing their home and family right. are not people who are thinking about what are the best things that we can do for for the longer term. Yeah, yeah. What can I do for the next generation if I can't feed my kids now? So I'm in a conversation at 7 a.m. on Mondays with a couple of guys from Amsterdam and Sweden, and and one of them is Hank Kuna, uh, who who has a thing called positive cartography. And he's trying to work with citizens of, of, the, of the Netherlands, uh, old, young, whoever, uh, to try to create positive maps, pictures, images of their future for the reason you just said. Well, it's, it's great if we can have images. And I actually, you know, this is something that I've, I've talked to a variety of people that I know who are writers and comic book writers and illustrators. Like, how do we come up with these visions of a, what a good future could look like? But ultimately, the, the issue of poverty and um, uh, something like um, pre precarity, actually precarity more than poverty. The issue of precarity is what keeps us from being able to, to think long-term because it's very difficult to think, of, to think long-term if you know that a lot of the steps that you can take that will ultimately be good will have an, an initial downturn as a, as a consequence and you can't survive that. You don't have enough, you don't have enough money in the bank to, to handle a $400 emergency expense. You're certainly not gonna be able to, to handle having a complete revolution of the economic system, right? at least in the short term. And, and, and so it's, I've seen this over and over again, people I've spoken to, people I've you know, had given talks to, and people I've spoken with, there's just so much worry about dealing with the immediate, dealing with the tangible and, um, and visceral, that to have a, a vision of a better world in the future is nice, but as imaginary as thinking that fairies are going to come down and, you know, think us all in the head and give, give us pumpkin-based uh, transportation systems. I would like one of those. Um, and shoot, I just had a thought in my head um, about the precariat. Oh, um, April and I got to attend Davos some years ago, 
And uh, they treated me really nicely. She was the attendee and I was her plus one, but I got a pass and I got to go to a bunch of stuff. And I signed up for a poverty simulation exercise. And a nonprofit had taken a local, the, the basement of a local apartment tower and they'd converted all the lockers and you know the storage lockers that are in the dingy basement, they'd converted into a pretend little sort of a refugee camp. And they split us up into families and JP Rangaswamy was in a family pod with me. And we were given a bunch of paper and flour and water and told to make bags out of newspaper. And basically you use the flour and water to make a paste, you fold it, you try to make a little bag and you put it in, in a heap. And your, your, your job then is to sell the bags you made to a merchant who's standing around and everything's working at pretty light speed and they do cycles. So like it's another day, you need to have made some money so you can actually pay for some water and some food and whatever. And a couple of things like April did the exercise a different day and hated it. And she's been in more poor places on earth than I have. I really liked it because one thing sank in really, really loud and clear, which was when you're under a lot of pressure and it's intense and it's kind of existential and we knew we weren't gonna get killed ourselves, but boy, to try to make it through, you don't have time to be clever. You don't have time to think. You're just trying to sort of make your way through, right? Yeah. Um, and then every now and then one of these people would, like a merchant would come by and say, yeah, these are terrible bags and shred your bags and throw them in the air. And you were like, oh, fuck. And then, and then at one point late in the game, one of the guys comes by and says, well, I see that you kind of need some, you see you're kind of in a fix here. I'd be willing to adopt your daughter for X, doll, X, X bucks. And you're like, ah, oh, Jesus, right? And, it, and it, 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 it had never been more clear to me how that dilemma works, how frequent it must be, uh, what's going on there and, and all of that. And it was awful. It was just, it was just really like this, this moral dilemma where do we all die? Do we sacrifice the kids? Do we this, do we that? You know, uh, really, really crazy. Uh, and, and, you know, every, every nonprofit's efforts to prevent this from happening and to, to lessen it are, are noble and, and fantastic. And, oh, my God, they're up against uh, crazy stuff. I also have a thought in my brain I put a link to here called Poverty is a Dismal Trap, where I have a bunch of different things about how being poor is really expensive. Every, everything costs more to poor people, and it's a piece of privilege that people of privilege absolutely ignore and don't realize. Like money is more expensive. I watched a video or read a story once about a guy who was who had lost, he was convicted, comes out of jail, can't hold a bank account because he's got a felony record. Therefore, he needs to buy debit cards or something like that. I'm, 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 I'm getting it wrong. But when he did have a job and did get some money, he had to go to a cash checking place to get, actually turn it into cash. Then he had to buy a debit card. So by the time he earned a hundred bucks, it had turned into 80 bucks that he could use. <clears throat> And I'm making up the numbers, but it was awful. A and he had to use public transit to get around and you know, he had no driver's license and, and all these things just added up to the point where you're like, how do you even like dig out of that situation? My and favorite think, version, part of that yeah. story is that you can, buy, you can buy $200 shoes that'll last you for 10 years, or you can buy $20 shoes that'll last you maybe a year. And you know, maybe more than twenty dollars shoes, but basically, being you know, being being able to buy the quality of thing, things that last takes more money than people have, so you end up paying a lot more for shoes over time. Right. And just that's just the one example that that I've seen used repeatedly. Of you, you want something that's going to last, well, you can't afford it, so you have to you spend more money making buying things that are crap because that's all you can afford. You know, I, I grew up in a in a fairly low income environment, although, although fortunately we got, I got, my family got to move out of that. So I have some, some degree of empathy just from my own lived experience, but I, enough to recognize that I know nowhere near enough about what it's, what it's actually like to be living in that kind of circumstance. And I know that a lot of the things, a lot of the visions of the future that I like to write about and the, the kinds of engagement with the environment and stuff like that, that I talk about is simply out of reach for the vast majority of people on this planet. And the problems that they are facing now and will face as the future becomes even more brittle and anxious and nonlinear and incomprehensible. I heard um, that somewhere. Yeah, as the future be even becomes even more complex and problematic, their response is going to determine whether 
a better future is even possible because if they don't get the better future, they're going to demand at least something. And I think we're very, this century is going to be known very much around the, yeah. you know, the axiom of um, if people if people aren't given something, given what they need, they're going to take it. And Nick Hanauer is very Nick Hanauer is quite eloquent about this. About if the billionaires don't wake up, everybody's going to be in, in in their homes with pitchforks. Yeah, the pitchforks are coming is his trope. And don't forget that this uh, what's been demonstrated in the last year is. Yeah, we, we have the resources. We can do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I... I don't think that's lost on anybody. Yeah. Why do you think lots of people aren't going back to shit jobs? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And Another that, shit that's, that augurs well for the future. Because, come yeah. on, yeah, we can do this. Only if things bend. Only if the system changes. It's well. changing. So anybody have a good story or a funny joke for us to end on so we don't all end in apocalyptic doom? Well, I'm really looking forward to the UAP slash UFO report. Oh, okay. That's, so that's coming out some, any, real, any day now. Um, it looks like there's something going on that we don't have an explanation for that none, none of the answers are encouraging because if it's something that is uh, well, there there are non-U.S. technologies. That means China, R Russia, whomever, is way more advanced than anyone expected. Right and to the point where they're beyond. Because this is these things would have to have been started production in the late '90s, early you know, early 2000s. This is like centuries in advance, or it's something that is outside of our even approach of control you know something from off the planet something from a different time or dimension and the fact that this is this is real and nobody knows what it is is actually kind of cool go ahead mika <laughs> so glad you're raising that why hasn't the navy improved its methods of, of you know evidence collection oh no no they, they have actually much better but they're just not releasing it um because that would well in part because that would give away what their technologies can do in terms of, uh, of image gathering and such. But and there, are, there are pictures that have been floating around of like taken by the pilots with their camera phones or with, with, with cameras have, on like, the plane. Very can they make out alien faces? Because we could use our face recognition systems on that. No, unfortunately not. Unfortunately not. But, but to make out um, fairly close shots of what these things look like and okay you know, so no obvious they, vector control no obvious three, you know may are they time travelers dimensional travelers or just plain old visitors from somewhere outside the solar system okay how does everybody vote time travelers sysadmins 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 <laughs> does anyone have a link for this i'd like to read about this a little yeah uh yeah, actually, um, Washington Post did a big thing. Uh, 60 Minutes did a, a lengthy uh, interview with one of the right. people that was actually very interesting just, just a few weeks ago. Um, and and you know, gonna... if you do 60 Minutes UFOs, you'll find, you'll find it. So okay. I, had a, I had a very tiny brush, not with a UFO, but with like what the technological answer to this might be, which is uh, a long time ago, and I can't find this video or evidence of this anymore. There was a, 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 a little technology company that was using micro flaps on a remote control airplane. And micro flaps are basically, you know, very, very small scale little flaps on the surface of the plane. And it was like a flying wing design. So it didn't have rudders and ailerons or whatever. Um, and this thing was unbelievably maneuverable. So because it could change the shape of the air around itself like, like, like that, it, it could kind of move in ways that are really unusual for any kind of aircraft. And if a human had been on board, they would have been squished or whatever. So, so you know, robotic uh, or remote controlled, but that technology simply vanished. Classified. And, and, and that's, that's what I thought is that, and I've seen a couple things sort of of that ilk that just disappeared on me. And I'm like, oh, must've been classified. Or, so. they, or, 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 you know, or, was your, <laughs> we're not there yet with the uh once the uh when xerox was um doing its color printing uh -huh. they um, they they demonstrated to the government powers of be dollars that print, yeah that they could print dollars 
that they were- They could un- counterfeit dollars that were undistinguishable from dollar dollars. Yeah. And you know what? Xerox stopped making those machines. Yeah, actually now it, it, there's tech built into every scanner um, and even into Photoshop. I, I tried to edit a photo I'd taken years ago that was like a pile of different different currencies from around the world. I was used, gonna put it into a presentation and Photoshop would not let me edit it because there were currency there was currency visible. Wow, yeah. that's, in, that's interesting. So, I mean, so I, mean, I was just throwing that out as, you know, there's another story for it's disappearing Right. Which was made, was made whatever. It could be that, in fact, the powers that be were managed to convince somebody that this wasn't a really good idea. Uh, Samurais it, gave up was, guns in the 16th century. Having discussed the incompetence in, of government in every other area, now we have to believe in the hyper-competence of government, too. Yes. But that's how things work. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, well, yeah, this is... A uh, hyper competence, I would feel like there's a hyper competence issue if we were trying to posit that these were, you know, these UAPs are th- things that we actually, our own spy planes. Or yeah, something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right. Um, yeah, absolutely. The, the idea that, that the military has been suppressing this information, that actually, given the combination of um, military classification and um, presumably mm-hmm. diligence, and the sociocultural pressure that says this is ridiculous. Yes. Yes. You're oh, little green men. Yep. Um, you know, can can we use can we use our face recognition to see the aliens in the window? It, right. Like, but why it's, it's, it's why that kind of knee jerk reaction? Our government inventing something like the other governments do to you know create new headlines so that we take our minds off of whatever's going on now. What do you think? What do you think the COVID pandemic was? Oh, <laughs> oh God! Do we have to end the call on that okay. note? Okay. No, I actually have, I have seen that, that yeah. very argument. Yeah. Very I, I, of course you have. And I'm just saying, we're sitting around here sounding just like those guys <laughs> about UFOs and the new report mm-hmm. coming out. Or yeah, what, what is my theremin when I UFO, need it? <laughs> what is that hiding? What is that taking our attention away from? Yes, well. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, uh, the election being stolen? I don't know. Yeah. All right, with general side eye, we should uh, wrap this call for this. <laughs> I, I think. I, I don't know. Thank you. Very r- rich and delightful discussion. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank that you, was really. Mary. Thank you for continuing to host this. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Love this. Thanks. Bye.